Hello, your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, here again, back for another episode of the History of Comics podcast, this time on the speculation crash of the 1990s. After the invention of the Comics Code Authority in the 1950s, perhaps the second darkest time in the American comic book industry was the speculation crash of the 1990s. Fueled by the wave of breakthrough comics in the 1980s that pushed the medium further than ever before, from Mouse to the Dark Knight Returns, along with the box office smash of Batman the Movie in 1989, comic books were at one of their high points, and the medium would go into the 90s with more record sales and acclaim. However, as high as one climbs, it only makes the fall that much more devastating, as much of this success was fueled by speculators who were buying comics not for the entertainment or artistic value, but as a poorly educated investment for the future. When the crash finally happened, it would devastate the American comic book industry, sending numerous artists and companies out of business and nearly destroying Marvel itself, leaving what, was, leaving what was left a shell that would take decades to recover from. The seeds of the speculation crash began back in the 1970s when Phil Schuling found the Seagate Distribution Company to create the direct market for comic book sales in 1972. Schuling was a longtime comic book fan and early innovator with helping found one of the first comic book conventions in 1968. With direct market sales, it allowed publishers to avoid newsstand channels and thus allow stores to buy comics directly from the companies at a discount, along with getting them earlier than the newsstands. With this, it gave rise to the comic book shops and specialty stores for retailers and was soon encouraged by publishers for money and the fan base, especially since revenues from newsstands were declining during the 1970s. With the rise of comic book stores, more independent comics like Cerebus and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles appeared as these stores as well, as they needed to fill their shelves with more than just Marvel, DC, and Archie. In addition, the direct market had a non-returnable policy on any books they ordered, allowing smaller publishers the ability to take more chances and doing more diverse books. However, comic book stores couldn't just fill their racks with just current comic books, but also supply back issues for collectors, leading to the rise of not only the collector's market, but also the speculator market. Soon, comic book specialty shops rose from 200 to 300 in 1974 to 1500 in 1980. All this fueled the rise of comic book markets in the 1980s, but also a recipe for disaster in the years to come. The 1980s would be a banner year for the American comic book market, with the big companies like Marvel and DC producing such works like Daredevil and The Watchmen, while independence rose with Cerebus and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. By 1988, 70% of comic book revenue in America was from the direct market and would receive a huge bush boost the next year with the release of Tim Burton's Batman the Movie in 1989, as customers loved getting not only Batman comic books, but also any related merchandise, such as t-shirts and toys and so forth thus making a boom for comic book stores in general. Comic book publishers also had numerous distributors to choose from, the key ones being Diamond Comics Unlimited, Capital City, and Heroes World. Soon, collectors and speculators started seeking out old issues as investments following the tradition of the baseball card market. As a result, they were not just seeking out old issues, but looking at new ones in the talent, believing that their creations would be the next big thing, thus a solid future investment. As if on cue, new superstar artists at Marvel, such as Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld, emerged and Marvel was more than willing to promote them in order to sell the books. Of course, the companies also started to exploit this with gimmicks, from Spider-Man number 1 having multiple variant covers, to X-Force number 1 being bagged with different trading cards, or most infancy X-Men number 1 having five different covers to form one big large one. This put retailers in a bind, though, as they would have to buy large amounts of each of these issues to meet the demand, and since the current distribution network required the orders to be non-refundable, if they couldn't sell them, they were, the stores were stuck with the unneeded stock. For now, though, everyone was making money, but the cracks were beginning to show. However, the very stars that Marvel started to promote those books, from Tom McFarlane to Rob Liefeld, also started feeling exploited. And they chose this opportune time to form their own company, Image, to keep much of their revenues for themselves. When Image Comics was formed in 1992, retailers loved it, as their comics were huge sellers with lines forming around the blocks. Of course, not all were just readers, but speculators looking to buy up those new number one books with the hopes that they would go up in value later on. This would later be fueled by the comic book industry itself, with even popular magazines like Wizard publishing price guides detailing how much each comic cost. It got to the point that some insiders st- stated that comic books were a better investment in stocks, something that even comic book legend Stan Lee dismissed, pointing out that comics like Action Comics No. 1 were valuable because they were rare. 
when they were when there were a million copies out there since X Men number one, they don't go up in value. Retailers noticed that the first two image books, Youngblood and Spawn, sold extremely well and even set sales records, but as the later books came out, like Wildcats, they started to sell a little less as more image books diluted the overall value. Nevertheless, they still sold extremely well, with the lowest selling Shadowhawk reaching 500,000 in sales. Soon, Image Comics was rivaling Marvel and DC in sales and even surpassed DC in 1992 before setting, settling in as America's uh, third largest comic book publisher. Many of the creators still played with gimmicks, though, such as notably Jim Valentino's Shadowhawk, who used multiple covers for his books, with him defending it as he always argued he wasn't as big a star as the rest of the Image founders. Overall, things were still looking good, but the bottom was about to fall out. To compete with Image, Marvel saturated the market with gimmicks while using subpar talent, choosing to move away from the superstar mentality with its artists, believing that's what helped lead to Image's creation. DC started events like the death of Superman and the breaking of the bat, with the death of Superman alone happening in Superman number 75 on November, of 19, November 18 of 1992, and would be a particularly huge event, leading to $6 million in sales for that single issue, along with being bagged in a black poly bag. DC even provided stores with a press kit, which included a cardboard coffin, stickers, and even a poster. It was a media event like no other in comics, fueled by the speculator market, who believed that the issue would be an instant collectible since, after all, this is the death of the original superhero. However, the day this would all change was April 25th, 1993, when Superman Returns and the Adventures of Superman 500 ship, revealing that Superman wasn't dead after all, sparking the end of the speculation market with a white bag issue, and by the next year, the comic... The comic uh, Superman number 75 had lost 95% of its value, and by the end of 1993, the bottom fell out of the industry. Thankfully, some retailers required customers to pay in advance for those pre-orders, saving them some of the financial heartache, but the crash had happened and there was no stopping it. This was further emphasized with Knight's End storyline in Batman books, which also restored Bruce Wayne to being Batman, thus reversing this change as well. Simply put, those original comics that started the events were no longer that significant. Though this was part of DC's overall plan with the book's both series, as they always stated that the plan was for Superman to come back to life and for Bruce Wayne to eventually take over as Batman. But the speculators finally realized that there was no real market investing in comic books. The market crashed, and it took the comic book industry with it. Seeing the downturn after the return of Superman, DC slowed down on the use of gimmicks, while Image Comics tried to fix the problem with late books. Though it did prompt the two biggest distributors, Cap- Capital and Diamond, to institute a 90-day return policy for retailers, allowing stores to return any unsold product to publishers within that window for a full refund. Marvel continued with its gimmicks, though, and even turned to making trading cards and making so-called collectible comics, believing that the speculation market was still in full effect. The company even tried to bypass the other distribution networks when it bought Herald's World in 1995 as its own distribution system in the hopes of containing cost. In response, Diamond signed exclusive deals with DC, Archie, Dark Horse, and Image, while Capital signed on Viz and Kitchen Sink. However, Capital City would go bankrupt the next year, with Diamond acquiring them as well. Retailers were incensed by the move, though, and Marvel found it would find out too late that Heroes World was not big enough to carry its own line, as they just simply didn't have enough product for one distributor. As one insider commented, Marvel's problem wasn't buying a distributor, but they bought the wrong one. Plus, with having to make multiple orders at less of a discount, it led to many comic book stores closing. Since Heroes World was too small to handle the large orders from Marvel, it was selling off its inventory for pennies on the dollar. Ultimately, this led to the company going bankrupt in 1997, and finally Marvel signed on with Diamond, who soon became the sole distributor for comic books in the United States. On December of 1994, Marvel started laying off employees for the first time in decades, dubbed the Marvelution in an attempt to clean the house. However, as layoffs continued, it was instead called the Marvel Marvel Cution. Ultimately, the company spent $350 million on Fleer, Skybox, along with Panini, Welsh, and Malibu, and these bad investments led to the company filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy under owner Ron Perlman in 1996. The company would immediately emerge in 1997 when Toy Biz bought Marvel, with Perlman being ousted from the company. Today, the comic book medium is still recovering from the speculation crash. While comics have not reached the height they once were, they have expanded into other areas, such as when Disney bought Marvel, which has since begun their Marvel Cinematic Universe in 2009, along with the spread of digital and online comics. 
No longer fueled by the collector or speculator market, comic book sales have rarely reached the, sa- the numbers that made during those times, though overall revenue has grown. Recently topped $1 billion in sales in 2015 overall in North America, where it has remained ever since. Now fueled by movies and TV along with other projects, the comic book industry isn't going anywhere, but for a brief time in the 1990s, it sure seemed like it was. Ultimately, the speculation crash serves as a warning against treating comic books as an investment. While a few rare comic books do receive large sales at auctions, Action Comics number 1, the first appearance of Superman, recently sold for $1 million, you can never predict what will be valuable in the industry. Like all great art, only time will, only time will reveal that. I would like to thank my main source for this episode, Image Comics, The Road to Independence by George Corey, which has a great article about the speculator crash. A great read for anyone interested. And now is January 2nd, 2020, time for the favorite comic of the week. Uh, Criminal, number 11, by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, which finds uh, Teague Lawless and his crew pulling off a big job at a wrestling event, only for something to fill off, thus pulling Lawless and Edge during the entire uh, heist. Brubaker keeps the attention as a razor edge, as uh, even though the heist seems to go off as planned, little things here and there just throw it off, like a guard being in the wrong place, someone asking the wrong questions, and you just never know when the shoe, other shoe's going to drop. It's just a, a tense thriller from the beginning to end. And, uh, of course, John Phillips' art is crime noir at his best, perfectly matched for his story, and The Criminal Remains, one of the best reads on the stands right now, highly recommended for crime comic fans and for uh, comic fans in general. This is a great A read, as always. And also, I want to give a shout-out to my friend uh, Dan Klink and his new partner, Mark McRae, for their new podcast, The Best Saturdays of Our Lives, which explores the uh, history of um, the uh, Saturday morning uh, cartoons. Uh, the first three episodes are currently up on iTunes and also Stitcher and other podcasting platforms, covering the sword and sorcery genre of the cartoons from uh, uh, Thundar to uh, He-Man to she and I was paying close attention for those familiar with that Jack Kirby episode uh, uh, about a year or so now back. Wow, I've been doing this for this long, huh? But uh, in that Thunder episode, uh, they do mention that, uh, yes, Jack Kirby was uh, on Thunder as art designer. So, yeah, he, Mr. McRae knows his stuff. He also read an excellent book called The Best Saturday of His Lives, for which this podcast is based on. For, so definitely check it out on all podcasting platforms. With that, uh, we will close out for today. But join me again next week when I begin a three-parter on the uh, history of American uh, female cartoonists. Uh, Till then, go out and enjoy yourself a good comic book.